My name is Stuart Wilson. I have been working with my friend uh, Joanna Prentice for over 20 years now to explore past lives uh, in a number of locations, but um, three of our books, I think in many ways the most important three books, focused on the Essenes. Uh, the very first book we produced, The Essenes, Children of the Light, was based on past life evidence. At that point, that is all we had. When we moved on to our second book, Power of the Magdalene, by that time we had acquired an angelic source. I say acquired, actually stumbled across would be a better phrase for it. How we came across Alariel, the leader of this uh, 12 angel group, uh, that story is told in our other book, Atlantis and the New Consciousness. It came out of a past life process. Uh, we didn't set out to get an angelic source, but as the past life process rolled on, as you'll see from the Atlantis book, uh, we did actually acquire an angelic source. This transformed our work in a way, because past life is a wonderful technique but you need the right people at the right place at the right time. If you might think, well, anybody who was there in Israel 2,000 years ago would be a real wonderful source of information. Not if they were a Pharisee and regarded Yeshua as a disturber of the peace and probably a destroyer of core Jewish values at that time. So it does very much depend on getting the right person at the right place at the right time. When we had acquired Alariel, that extended our uh, access considerably. We were able to ask very fundamental questions. Uh, how many female disciples were there? If we had asked my character, Daniel Ben Ezra, who was an elder in the Hebron community at that time, if we'd asked Daniel, he might have said, oh yes, many, oh, quite a number. But he might not have known how many. In the case of Alariel, he was able to say immediately, 72, and there were 72 male disciples, and that makes the symbolic number, the very powerful number, 144. So we were able to get direct access to facts and figures and numbers, which many people on the ground at the time might not have known about. Some key questions took a long time coming. Uh, the group was very conscious of other groups doing research, particularly if they were about to publish. And in one case, we couldn't access a key piece of information about Mary Magdalene, that was who her father was. In the Jewish tradition, really important to know who your father is. It's a, it's a key to understanding the place of the character within the society at that time. It was very, very much a patriarch. It still is to a great degree, but even more so 2,000 years ago. When we got the information, that opened up a whole new chapter in our work. Alariel told us that um, Mary Magdalene's father was called James. He was a wealthy Jewish merchant, and he lived in a place called Tyana. Now, Tyana is, is now in the south central area of Turkey. It was not Turkey at that time. It was part of the old Hittite empire, a crumbling empire which was really past its peak in many ways. And that's in the land between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. Um, the key thing really about James, uh, Mary Magdalene's father, the key thing is he was a friend of Joseph of Arimathea. Now, Joseph was in many ways the linchpin of the whole Essene operation. He was a member of the core group, and we talk about the core group in our first book, uh, the most secret group in the whole Essene Brotherhood, a group about which many Essenes knew nothing because they operated on a need-to-know basis. This was the core group which tried to safeguard as much as possible the safety of Jeshua, couldn't do it completely, but tried to do it as much as they could. And they supported his work and were responsible really for implementing the instructions laid down uh, by the Kalu, who are messengers. And Dolores's book, uh, Jesus and the Essenes, talks about the Kalu. But the Kalu really were taking orders from the order of Melchizedek. 
the Melchizedeks were running the show. And the Essenes had been working uh, for the order of Melchizedek for at least 150 years before the birth of Jeshua. So this was a long time period. Uh, Joseph uh, had a very large uh, commercial fleet, 150 ships, very big fleet in its day. And his wealth, and he was the richest man in Israel at that time, his wealth was drawn from his holdings of tin. He controlled most of the productive tin mines in Cornwall. At that time, in the ancient world, if you wanted tin, you had to go to Cornwall. Uh, in, in this age, there are other sources. There are South American sources and so on. But at that point, if you wanted tin, you really had to go to Cornwall, and he controlled over 90% of the productive mines in the Cornish tin industry. Um, but there's an interesting twist to this. Joseph also knew James's father, Mary's grandfather. And James's father wasn't even Jewish. At that time, it was permissible for Jews, especially wealthy Jews, to marry out. That custom fell into disuse by about the year 200, 300. Uh, then there was very little marrying outside the Jewish religion. But at that point, 2,000 years ago, yes, it did happen. And he wasn't Jewish, this grandfather of Mary. He was Persian. And his name was Balthazar. He is one of the three wise men. So through Balthazar, Joseph of Arimathea had a link to Mary Magdalene even before she was born. When she was born, Balthazar, as a great astrology, immediately did her birth chart. And when he saw her birth chart, he knew immediately this was a special soul with remarkable spiritual gifts and a big, really big spiritual destiny. He called a meeting with his son James and with Joseph, and it was decided that if James died young, and there was a lot of adult mortality at that time, no national health service. You were on your own if you got ill, really. And it was decided if James died young, uh, then Joseph would adopt Mary and bring her to Jerusalem, the very center of Jewish culture at that time. Uh, when um, Mary is eight years old, uh, James, her father, catches a fever and he dies. Uh, the families send word immediately to Joseph. He goes to Tyana and with the family's blessing, adopts Mary, brings Mary back to his big house in Jerusalem. Joseph was very close to his sister. Um, her real name is Mary Anna, but she's known to the world as Mother Mary. Mary Anna's son is Jeshua, and he was a regular visitor to his uncle's house in Jerusalem. And that is how the 11-year-old Jeshua meets the 8-year-old Mary Magdalene. She was not actually called Mary, of course, at that time. I'm using that name because she's widely recognized under that name. She was actually called Miriam of Tyana. She acquires the name Mary Magdalene later on when she enters the Isis temple in Alexandria. They have, at that point, one magical year together. That's how Alarion describes it. And during that magical year, they discover a deep spiritual bond, and they discover many past lives together. How did they explore their past lives? Was there a friendly past life therapist somewhere in Jerusalem saying, oh, yes, I can book you in next Tuesday, my dear? <laughs> no, sadly not. So how did they do it? How they explored their past lives is really interesting. They used a crystal called an, an elestial. Now, if you go into a crystal shop and ask for an Alestial, they'll probably give you something about that size, maybe a little larger, a little smaller. That's not an Alestial. That's a tiny fragment of an Alestial crystal. I've only seen one Alestial in my life. Uh, they're very heavy. The one I saw was about two foot long. Uh, it's um, 
set around the faces, are set around a rock core. That's what makes it really heavy. I could just about lift it and put it down again. 